On a hazy October morning in 1927, a car speed chase resulted in one of the most notorious murders and ghosts in Cincinnati's history, that of Imogene Remus, a.k.a. the Eden Park's Lady in Black. Join Kat, Christina, and Jen as we discuss tonight's tale of weird history and ghosts left in its wake. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities presents Hometown Haunts. I'm your host, Kat Cloco, and with me, like every week in the shadows, I have Jen Kohler and Christina Wald, and we're here to share some of the Cincinnati area's local weird history. Welcome, welcome. Uh, you can find us on social media at Sin Cabinet Curio on Twitter at Cincy Cabinet. Yeah, Cincy. Cabinet of Curiosities on Instagram and hometown haunted mail at gmail.com for all your wonderful spooky ghost story needs. If you have a hometown haunt, it doesn't have to be from Cincinnati. From anywhere in the world, you can send it to us at hometown haunted mail at gmail.com. Also, Jen would like me to let you know that we're an official podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, and SoundCloud. Plus, I think other things now, too. Eh, she's giving me the... Find us on iTunes at Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities. Please rate and review us on everything. YouTube, Amazon, iTunes, all that. And so other spooky lovers can find us and share the wonderful weird history of the Cincinnati and Tri-State region. And of course, links to all of our information are in the show notes. So, ladies, come forth from the darkness and share with me your adventures for the past few weeks, such as <laughs> visiting tonight's location and what we've been all up to. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, that sounds nice. <laughs> I've been trying to finish my book for the San Diego Zoo, so I've been painting lots of rainforest pictures and sloths and rainforest animals, and the book is really fun, and I can't wait to uh, share it. And also, another one of my books just came out called The Train Rolls On, which is about a train uh, taking a bunch of animals to the zoo, So, and it turned out really mm -hmm. cute, too. So I've been very busy. I'm still finishing my book off, but... Um, you know, it was a nice break to be able to get as much art done as possible on it. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, definitely. That's, I think, what at least Christina, you and I were doing was just art, just making up for art. And uh, yeah, I thought about working. art. <laughs> you thought about, you took some nice photos though, and you've been sharing them. Actually, both yeah. of you have been sharing your uh, projects. I didn't want to say art project because that made us sound like we're in elementary school, but <laughs> all your projects on instagram so mm -hmm. actually for our listeners besides the since he, oh my goodness you, you know I, I say this every single week since the cabinet of curiosities is our instagram but you also both have uh instagram accounts so really early mm -hmm. in the show what are they M mine is j b and i don't remember j b kohler k-o-e-h-l-a-r yeah and Christina. Yeah. <laughs> Mine is C S W Yellow Cat spelled Y E L L O K A T. And it's spelled so weird because for some reason I wish I just picked my name for my Instagram account, but back then they told you to have like an alias. I don't know. I mean internet stuff's weird. That's all I need to say. <laughs> Trends are changing all the time. <laughs> yes. It used to be like so when you see people that have weird names, it's because they used to say, Oh, don't have your name in the name of the it's stupid. Yeah. And so and I ruined my Twitter account and my, so there's other Christina Walds on Twitter that are, Twitter and Instagram that are not me because I didn't claim it soon enough. No, oh, yeah. you can always go back and be like, I'm Christina Wald prime or something like that. <laughs> that always wins people over. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are other Jen Kohlers out there in the world. Uh, luckily for the most part, I have my name. Or at least my initials. I think on Twitter, mm -hmm. I'm like JB Kohler one or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, somebody else got it before I did. <laughs> I do have you know my what? URL. But whenever I read your name, Jen, I kind of make mm -hmm. it JB Fletcher because yeah. <laughs> I'm a product of the 80s. And 
my goodness murder she wrote was popular in my household so it's yeah it's like yeah maybe f- no not fletcher no no i've but, o- often thought that should like be my pen name or something like if i that'd ever be fun. publish have, that's very popular that way i wouldn't have to spell out my entire first name because professionally normally i'm known as jennifer mm-hmm. and it, imagine like not that i'm ever going to be famous enough to give autographs but imagine <laughs> just having to sign that over and over and over you know yeah mm. yeah <laughs> well it also if it's kind of it's gender neutral yeah so mm-hmm. yeah and uh, if, if people want to know mine is red cat comics and uh, just like red cat in a comic so <laughs> you know i think as long as people can find you i think if you do a search on my name my accounts still come up it's just you know one of those weird things that um you know at least i got my url early enough that i i have that so the other christina mm-hmm. walds are probably irritated but you know you can only do what you can do right yeah. um well I, I don't want to ever Google myself. From... Oh, <laughs> no, I just don't. It terrifies me. Like, I don't want to know what's out there. I don't think there's anything weirder out there under my name. Probably not. But I don't want to find out how creepy truly the internet is where, you know, all of my information comes up and <laughs> just, just is... watch it. Google yourself and you're on wiki feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you know it's it's easy i just don't if i don't know about it then i feel safer well (laughs) if i know it's out there i'll worry about it (laughs) well speaking of weird fetishes we are up to our uh what would you say up to our tukuses in what did you say brood 10 cicadas i was saying the horny teenagers Mm, yes yes so so we did experience that yesterday in eden park Mm, uh i bet yeah um uh, you could hear yeah. them. <laughs> Jed loves them. You could see. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just so much love in that face. Yeah. So uh, we had a couple hitchhikers. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that it's been fun. <laughs> I'm liking this. It's like a meteorological event. So mm-hmm. my my neighbors and I actually at the very start when they started emerging out of the ground, we're going out and video videotaping. Oh, geez. That makes me sound ancient. We were recording them popping out of the ground. And one night they were all really coming up. It was the first night we had over 70 degrees and mm-hmm. they were all crawling. And I had about a dozen of them crawling up my pant leg before they had molted. So they were still the little brown shrimp <laughs> looking things. And I was just like, no guys, mm-hmm. I'm not a tree. Because if they latch on, they start molting. And then if they fall off, or get disrupted the entire process stops and they die so i was just trying to move them off of me with twigs as quickly as i could and so then i learned my lesson and just kept having to move and then you also have to watch where you're stepping because they're coming out of the ground you know crunch crunch, crunch them so yes you do no they're very beneficial to the ecosystem but and we're going to be going into detail in a couple of weeks about them too we will how be. can you let an event like this go past yeah but if you're in the eastern side of the united states right now in the mid-temperate area hello horny teenagers raining from above flying into your coffee it, it's just brood x is everywhere and there are three species within brood x as well it isn't just mm-hmm. one cicada well, that'll be really oh. interesting. Um, they just yeah, need to stay I, out of my hair. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That can get it can get messy. But mm-hmm. wear a hat. Put your hair in the bun. <laughs> wear a hat. Yeah. I had a hat on, and my hair was up. And it I, still have got in there. <laughs> I have a safari hat. I have a safari hat. Yeah, need that's to get what net. this is. Um, yeah. My hat is a safari hat, and it has netting all around, and I can mm-hmm. cinch it closed while I'm yes. walking the dogs, so they're just not flying mm-hmm. into my hair but yeah. they do kind of have slightly sharp i don't want to call them claws their feet their legs so thankfully they they di- it didn't like dig in because i just felt a little wiggle and then i put my hand up there and i just grabbed it and poor thing mm-hmm. i just the, the the wiggly the wiggly sen- ew i mean i'm fine cockroaches just- crawl on me this was near <laughs> not nearly as bad Mm-hmm. No, I think I'd go crazy if that happened to me. I have, I, I do have not an, like I have bugs. A, 
I have a very, <laughs> a very uh, scary insect story, but I'm not going to tell here. I'm going to wait till our cicada episode. Okay, I'm looking forward. So to it's it. a. T- I'm so, going to tease with it because it was like something out of a horror movie, but oh, I don't yes. want to. I don't want to say no. it here because next, no, no. next. No, uh, I'm excited. In two weeks. In two weeks, because next oh, week we yay. have, we're going to be talking about tarot. Uh, picking up from our conversation a couple weeks ago, uh, a friend of mine who is putting together a tarot deck and actually kickstarting it. Uh, starting next week is going to be on our next show. Her name's nice. Stephanie Cost, and um, she's an incredible artist, and she's got a lot of really. I sent you all a link to. Uh, it's the fine. Cards. You can say y'all. We're in Cincinnati. <laughs> uh a a link to the work and um there's some really amazing uh pieces in it yeah yeah i'm looking forward to speaking to her um same show it's tarot is something that is it's very personal actually so we'll be see neat seeing her insights what what inspires her to draw what she does for each card and all that Mm -hmm. yeah and and we went to hail covington yesterday Oh, yay. And we saw a bunch of, it was a neat store. Um, yeah, it was a really cool store. And uh, they had a variety of tarot decks, including the traditional one. And we'll talk more about that the next episode. But that was part yeah. of our grand day out. Jen and I went to Eden mm-hmm. Park and filmed the area mm-hmm. where, uh, and shot some footage of where the shooting happened. And then we kind of walked around the park and it was, there was just all sorts of interesting things happening at the park yesterday. Eden Park's quite popular on the weekend. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, people posing for photo shoots and <laughs> films. And of course we were filming. So mm-hmm. everyone was filming. Um, yeah, everyone. Uh, we'll post some of Jen's uh, really cool photos uh, to our Instagram and check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the last bit of news is Christina and I will be taking part in this year's Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, Woo-hoo. as well as our Cabinet of Curiosities art director, Tim Fuller. Yeah, this is uh, very exciting. Yeah, I, I, you know, I can't wait till the show's actually live. It's going to be online again this year, but we had mm-hmm. some great discord chats last year. Um, you should be able to, we should be able to have the first issue of of uh hometown haunts to say cabinet of curiosities for sale and uh mm-hmm. will be i think will the kickstarter will have started when the is it in october or september i guess i should know that so it it, it is both <laughs> okay it so starts like september straddling. 30th and it goes to october 3rd it's mm-hmm. four days of comics fun and for those of you who have not encountered cartoon crossroads columbus it is a very fun independent and small press uh, art fair book fair i guess that would be for comics so uh, I, it is in association with the columbus ohio public library system and the billy ireland library and museum which is a large comics library and museum that is on the ohio state university's campus and i believe also many events happen with the Ohio State University. I have to say the in front of this because that is what their charter does. You have to say the before. Really? Yes. Interesting. So I- yeah, they may sound really pretentious, but they actually, that's what the charter, I think it was like 1816 or so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what it says is the Ohio State University. Yeah. And so- for those interested in comics, I mean, you can't, I mean, they have some of the best guests and most interesting guests that they interview. And of course, Jeff Smith of Bone is like one of their, like he's almost at all, all of their events. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the actual Billy Ireland Museum was started by Milton Caniff, who was well known for his newspaper paper comics. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, most of, uh, Bill Watterson's collection is at the Billy Ireland museum. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great that being online, you don't have to be in within driving distance of Columbus to be able to uh, participate. And who knows, we may end up doing a Cincinnati cabinet of curiosities, hometown haunt event for the programming. I just talked about how to make local legends into comics. So um mm-hmm. but i i can't guarantee anything we don't know what the programming is yet mm-hmm. and issue two is is going along we should be done with most of the artwork in about a month um we've been talking to the cover artist mm-hmm. it is david michael beck and it should be really in- 
you know, I'm, it's all coming together, isn't it? I mean, having yeah. seen everything. We have a together. nice balance of ghost stories and cryptids and urban legends. So it is, I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just on a personal note, I think my artwork is much better this issue. So <laughs> I, I'm very proud of what I'm creating. I have I my own say, little it, ghost it looks story. Great. I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it's just a lot better than the first issue. So lots of improvement yeah this is, it's just going to be i mean not that the first i mean the first issue was really good and this has got some really even i don't want to say I, don't, I hate using words like better but it's going to be a really good issue <laughs> i think it'll be a stellar issue yeah you you hate yes. to, it's like it's like uh you know whenever i do school visits uh one of the questions i always get is what's the favorite book that you've worked on and oh. usually i just say the one that i just most recently finished because it's done <laughs> That's a good response. It's really yeah, that's hard an honest to, response. It's really hard to say which you liked bad, best because you're the worst judge in a way of what you're working on too. Because yeah, you know each each project that's a sequential art thing, whether it's a picture book or a comic, is a journey. Mm -hmm. You know, and and no no two are the alike, and uh, you have you battle different. It's like each one's a different boss monster that you're fighting the whole time. You know, yeah. you start. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like a progression of a video game. And at the end, you're like, oh my gosh, I survived. Yeah, I, I slaughtered that beast. I sent exactly. him that manuscript. And I got some experience points. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I really I, wish I got the experience point time whenever I finished a project. <laughs> Right. I see a cat tail. There's a, there's no, a I tail. Think, I think that means it's time to segue into the, to the topic at hand. Yes. So the topic at hand, speaking of books and projects, this is me doing kind of a small plug. We're kind of inspired off, off of my own book, since or Ohio's Haunted Crimes by Schiffer Publishing. You can buy it on Amazon. It is the first chapter of this book, which is the haunted bootlegger. <laughs> I almost said bootlicker. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, glad I got that. That must. Yeah. The tonight's topic is the haunted bootlegger George Remus and his tragic wife Imogene. And uh, this was just kind of going a little intro before starting. Is when I moved here to Cincinnati. Besides Loveland Castle and of course um, Bobby Mackey's. People have said, well, you have to go see the Lady in Black at Eden Park. And I'm like, okay. And uh, boot bootleggers and prohibition is not something that was history I was very familiar with until working on this piece. So, uh, like, so yeah, th this is a well-known story. So, what is it? Ken Burns did a good documentary series called Prohibition for PBS. That also talks about George Remus. Uh, so for this topic, of course, I use sources from the Cincinnati Enquirer, Cincinnati Magazine, numerous archives um, of the original newspapers that ran, such as the Indianapolis Star, and uh, so much book research. Um, and also later on, Jen and Christina can talk about their adventures at Eden Park from yesterday. So let's start in Chicago, 1885. There was a 14 year old George Remus who was working in his uncle's pharmacy to support his family because his father was unable to work. Five years later, Remus graduated from the Chicago College of Pharmacy, became a certified pharmacist and took over his uncle's store. Even expanding the pharmacy by building a second location. At this time, George is married and has a young daughter which is Romola that we talked about. By age 22, he grew tired of being a pharmacist in the pharmacy business and instead became a lawyer. So he actually went to law school at night after closing up shop from his pharmacy business. He was admitted into the Illinois College of Law and later passing the bar exam in 1904. He was a criminal lawyer whose specialty was murder cases and became famous for the highly publicized William Cheney Ellis murder case in 1914. In this case, Remus coined the term transitionary insanity, which would evolve into the current temporary insanity defense. 
1920, Remus was seeing an annual income of $500,000 a year. So this man was already quite wealthy. He had managed to grow from being a German immigrant with an alcoholic father into one of the best criminal lawyers or defense attorneys in Chicago. So he's well known, and especially with his clients, who all were uh, mobsters in Chicago. Funny that. During this time, he starts ordering groceries from a delicatessen in his office's neighborhood, where a cute divorcee named Imogene Holmes works. Imogene is a 20-something with an ex-husband and a daughter as well. Her name is Ruth. Remus would come in the morning to order his groceries, then return later in the day to pick them up while chatting with an animated Imogene. George showered her with gifts, and later she became a secretary at his law practice, which led to an affair, which led to Remus's first wife divorcing him. In January 17th, 1920, Prohibition starts uh, with the passing of the Volstead Act. Remus, a smart man, noticed that his criminal clients were becoming very wealthy very quickly by running illegal alcohol production and distribution around the Midwest. Using both his knowledge of the pharmacy business, because, well, gee, he was a pharmacist at one point, coupled with his knowledge of the law, he was able to run distilleries and sell bonded liquor in his own pharmacies. Remus relocated to Cincinnati with Imogene and her daughter Ruth, which was a great move on their part, since it's where 80% of bonded whiskey was produced within 300 miles of the city, not only produced, but also stored. Uh, at that time, at one time, he owned 7% of the medicinal alcohol market. Imogene and Remus were married in Newport, Kentucky on June 25th, 1920. So for those who don't know, bonded liquor was basically liquor that was produced before prohibition and then stored by the U.S. government and slowly could be sold off for medicinal purposes because back when prohibition started, sometimes forms of alcohol were still considered medicine and used in medicine. So uh, what Remus did was basically, as a pharmacist, created his own pharmacies and distilleries, bought bonded liquor, and then his own men would rob his own pharmacy trucks and then sell the uh, whatever percent of alcohol that he had robbed from himself onto in the black market. So that's how that all worked. And it was, as, uh, what was it, Kevin Burns said, he called it the circle, was the the process that this happened. I'm getting nods. Anyway. For five years, Remus lived a lavish lifestyle in Cincinnati with Imogene. They had had lavish, lavish parties at their mansion, nicknamed the Marble Palace, which was in Price Hill and gave out new cars to female guests and a dime of stick pins or watches to male partygoers in one notorious 1920s New Year's party. It all came crashing down when Remus was indicted on thousands of violations against the Volstead Act and quickly found guilty by a jury in under two hours. He was given a two-year federal prison sentence at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, There, he befriended a fellow inmate named Franklin Dodge and confided in him that his wife had control over the entire estate and his money. What Remus did not know, however, was Dodge was an undercover prohibitions officer and that he quickly left the case and made his way to Cincinnati to meet Imogene. (laughs) She sounded very available and very wealthy. An affair quickly sparked between Dodge and Imogene and I will say, looking at a photo of Frank Dodge, he looks remarkably, remarkably like Remus. So she had a type. And they started liquidating Remus's assets and hiding as much money as they could. Reportedly, they gave Remus only $100 out of the multi-million dollar empire, which he had got when he got out of prison. Imogene and Dodge also hired a hitman for $15,000. Now, mind you, this is in 1926 money, so I I can't do the math on how much that would be now, but a lot. But the hitman feared being double-crossed and told Remus about the hit instead. After seven years of marriage to Imogene, they filed for divorce in the Hamilton County Court. 
It was the morning of October 6th, 1927, when Imogene and her daughter took a taxi to the Hamilton County Courthouse for the finalization of their divorce from the hotel, which was the Alms Hotel in Walnut Hills, where they were staying. And yet again, the Alms Hotel plays a part in one of our stories. George Remus, however, had his driver follow them through the city and a low speed chase ensued. And I only am kind of sounding like I'm laughing because I'm imagining these Model T's slowly going through the streets of Cincinnati, winding through Eden Park. The image is just kind of odd in my head. The car chase set them through the winding curves of Eden Park before Remus's car forced uh, Imogene's taxi off the road in front of the Eden, car <laughs> Eden Park gazebo. Imogene got out of the car and ran through traffic, which had built up, as did Remus. And in front of horrified onlookers, Remus shot Imogene once in the stomach. She died later that day at what is now a Bethesda hospital. Remus was apprehended. Actually, he uh, turned himself in about an hour later. And the at the trial, he used the same temporary insanity defense that he had actually coined. The jury only took 19 minutes to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. And he was committed to the insane asylum where he spent only seven months before being released. And if you read back at the newspapers at the time, my goodness, the Cincinnati Inquirer was all about George Remus and the entire trial. And then the second trial that he had, with air quotes, of proving that he actually wasn't insane so that he could be released from the state hospital. Um, the rest of his life was spent in Covington, Kentucky, with his third wife and former secretary, Blanche Watson. He died in 1952. He had tried to get back into the uh, whiskey game and the liquor game, but by then different mobs and other personalities had basically taken over the market and he was no longer able to recoup everything that he lost. Imogene, it seems, has not rested in peace. Whenever the autumn air creeps into the sidewalks and streets of Cincinnati, Imogene has been seen walking around the gazebo still adorned in her lavish black flapper dress, pinned hair, and black velvet cloche. Her impressive dress and ghostly presence has stunned joggers and very early morning dog walkers taking in the chilly air around Mirror Lake for decades. When approached, Imogene just fades away back into the shadows, reminding us about the tragic life that she led. And that is an abbreviated story of George Remus and Imogene. Wow, what a story. Yeah, I say abbreviated because there is, I mean, there are literal books written about just this case, but um, he- It kind of reminds me of the Edith Klump story because it seems like yeah. it's another thing where somebody has an affair with someone and, you know, the guy gets off scot-free. Yeah. I and mean, what's interesting- He didn't suffer it, at all. Yeah, mm -mm. no. Um, yeah. Um, so with- the Marble Palace, which was the mansion that they had in Price Hill, that was raised in the 1930s shortly after the trial. So it, that one doesn't exist anymore. It's now apartment buildings, actually several different apartment buildings. However, his house in Covington still stands. I don't know if you two were able to go visit it when we you did. Went out. And we Yay! Had to so you, you. That no, explains why it was so much less lavish than the home that was shown. Yeah, he and, did and not actually, have the money. He yeah, did not have the money. If you um, look at the Ken Burns documentary, they show the lavish interior of the lavish house that they had in Price Hill and how beautiful it was and everything. Yeah, the government seized a lot of their funds, I believe. And Romola, who is his daughter from his first wife, um, she was a hollywood silent film actress and she in a stage performer and vaudeville performer and she was one of the first child well-known child actors turned adult actors and um coined well, not coined but originated the role of dorothy for the wizard of oz on the stage 
and um, was seen in many silent films. And also she did radio plays and was a dancer. So after she got married in Chicago, she taught dance and everything, but she largely um, kept her, funded her father. Uh, she paid his legal bills and then helped pay for his lifestyle after he got out of jail. So um, in the hospital. So she, ple- if you read through all the newspapers there's, and I, I know I've taken clips and I've, uh, hopefully we're showing them over our faces right now. Um, she, yeah, she did a lot to keep her father afloat afterwards. And uh, that was very generous in 1983. So, yeah. Um, so wow, a lot of famous faces in this family, basically, but you two managed to go out. I, I hurt my leg, so I wasn't able to leave the house, but you two able to have this great adventure. You went to Eden park, you saw the cicadas and you, you went places. So tell us about that. Well, one thing that I thought was interesting that you said from watching boardwalk empire, is that the name of the show with Bashimi? Mm-hmm. you had yeah. mentioned that, um, You had mentioned that Remus referred to himself in the third person, and they actually mentioned that in um, the Ken Burns documentary as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Apparently, he liked to speak of himself in the third person for whatever reason. He was very egotistical once he became very wealthy. So it wasn't something he did when he was still working in Chicago. It's a habit he so started. it's a fancy i'm money and important i'm gonna yeah they're like so important everybody to refer to wants myself to come in the third Cincinnati person? and buy the remus liquor they have to come to remus if they want the remus liquor writes george remus, remus, <laughs> oh, so, remus. so it's branding it's good branding well he, and he was like good he was at a branding. colossal yeah. narcissist oh yeah yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> well you, uh, ha- I mean, you have to be to do what he did yeah you'd have to be he was I mean, also he very brilliant because she had an affair and was taking his money. Well, That's I, his. well she can't have it. Right. And, and I thought <laughs> it, it was, I thought it was a very interesting um, concept that, that he had actually developed the insanity defense on another client <laughs> before he used it on himself successfully. Um, yeah. Which, you know, is, is pretty slimy actually. Um, he you was know. slimy, but he was also very, very smart. Mm-hmm. Because he yeah. managed to put himself through pharmacy school and lawyer, law mm-hmm. college. There we go. Um, <laughs> law, law school. I lawyer like law school. Oh, lawyer no. school. Yeah, um, law. <laughs> all our lawyers just heads and hands. <laughs> anyway, um, he did it under the age of 23 and had yeah. a wife and a young child at the time, too. So this man knew how to work but yeah he was slimy yeah and i mean you know the the victim here imogene i mean you know and what she did was i i i suppose you know it, it's sort of uh you know everybody was kind of bad in this story i suppose if you could if you could look at it um, there are no winners yeah there's None. no winners in this i mean she cheated on her husband with the the person investigating him and mm-hmm. you know they hid a bunch of the money and stuff um you know so it, it seems like and so the, the, that's why and, and the, what you know hooks it to the hometown haunts is she's supposedly still haunting that now have you ever talked to anyone that's kind of felt her presence there or nope absolutely no one <laughs> um i mean we so didn't see when anything. i was yeah it it's so she comes out really early in the morning uh. and um so that's why I joke about the early morning joggers and dog walkers are the ones who usually witness her. And so she was gunned down in the early morning, I think slightly before eight. And she died about, well, within the same day um, at what I think is now Bethesda hospital in Cincinnati downtown. And Mm -hmm. Ruth was the one who ended up having to deal with a lot of the press afterwards and that's how come I know they were staying at the Alms Hotel. They had been hiding out from George. That's why they were in Walnut Hills and took a taxi is because they were hiding out from Remus because he was stalking them and trying to figure out where in the city they were. At the time, you had to show up at divorce hearings to actually get divorced. So he knew if he could get her on the way to court, um, it, it would 
that it was almost a guarantee that he could get her along the route but finding her was the hard thing and unfortunately i've never figured out how he knew that she was in walnut hills other than probably somebody told him that through the grapevine but well, he certainly um, had a huge network so he had a large a, I yeah mean... vast and he paid off everyone he i think mm-hmm. he famously said that uh, everyone had a price and uh, that's how he got a for so many years about three years he was able to keep the bonded liquor that that circle pro- process that he had robbing his own trucks because he was paying off everyone all the local enforcement and he even had ties up to washington and they eventually all just turned on him and uh, that's how he got sent to prison so mm-hmm. yeah it's and- such an interesting story i mean the whole prohibition era of of uh, our history uh, you know, basically starting out as an anti-immigrant. I mean, one reason the prohibition passed was you had, again, a lot of Protestants didn't like the uh, Catholic immigrants from Germany and from Ireland coming in and taking jobs. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, of course, Cincinnati was, uh, you know, filled with German immigrants. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, that was one thing that was interesting in the Prohibition series where they said Carrie Nation said that she couldn't possibly smash all the bars in Cincinnati because there were so many. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we had a she lot was, of bars, but a lot of She brothels. was cool. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it was one of those things where, you know, and, and w- we went to the Prohibition Museum in another very haunted place um, down in Savannah, Georgia. They have a huge Prohibition Museum there. And um, uh, suitably for the topic, uh, we were meeting a bunch of friends from the Drinking Liberally chapter of Cincinnati that uh, many of them have <laughs> moved away. And so we all took a vacation in 2019 to Savannah and the Prohibition Museum. You know, a lot of people thought if you took away the drug that people would be good, like, you know, mm-hmm. that all society's ills would be cured. It's like the same thing with anything. You know, you always try to blame the substance instead of the society that creates the ills like why are people mm-hmm. upset you know because maybe they don't get paid enough and jobs are terrible and labor is is treated badly but instead you try to blame the alcohol mm-hmm. you know um you know you, you say that families are broken up not because of bad labor conditions but because you know um people are drinking and mm-hmm. so they managed to push these laws through and you know fortunately they were repealed but there's still a lot of like like hangover uh uh like the blue laws like there's a lot of dry counties in kentucky still you know and there's places where you can't order alcohol on sundays or before noon on sundays you know that's where i grew up yeah the town where my husband's from they were trying to pass a law so restaurants could serve liquor and it failed because pastors were telling their congregations not to vote for it wow so there's still people that yeah, we're still seeing a lot of repercussions from then. Yeah. But it makes the Cincinnati area and also Indiana really interesting for history because mm-hmm. you have places like in Hamilton, Ohio, where you have underground tunnels going from the river to a lot of what would have been the bars and brothel area. In um, Indiana, there is a place called the Rhodes Hotel and they would fake funerals and just fill the casket full of booze. So when the sheriffs were on patrol, it would look like a funeral and then it would be an illegal gambling hall um, in the back room going on. And they came up with all sorts of uh, clever ways to get around the rules. And Cincinnati and definitely Newport, Kentucky were the kings of doing this. So this um, is one of those times where i'd love to have a time machine to see cincinnati in the 1920s and 30s because it was probably amazing to see like the architecture um mm -hmm. you know i've been trying to find reference for the comic uh, of laura pruden's home in price hill which that's also so they were practically neighbors uh yeah she was there in the 20s and her um you know sir arthur conan doyle visited her in 
1922. So that was two years after he moved there, right? Was it 1920 yeah. that he? Yeah. yeah. He and so they were practically neighbors. So um, the pictures of the house I saw were years later and you could tell like it wasn't in good repair or whatever, but mm -hmm. it was probably beautiful in its prime, you know, and you know, the pictures of his home, which was raised. Um, I saw where it was. We didn't go up to the location where the house was i'm not sure yeah. what's there now it, it's um, just a bunch of apartment blocks what's mm -hmm. fun is that they're still finding um underground tunnels from the property they mm -hmm. occasionally you'll have um the ground will fail and they'll find a uh, underground tunnel that was built there's a few that have been mapped out but yeah that entire property was raised and uh they were nice grounds he had tennis courts a bocce court um mm -hmm. stables the, i think he had one large rose garden it, it's it, with did a they tear it down just because of the stigma of it or most likely that's probably what it was because it happened that's... in the 30s that's but too bad he well he bought out uh so many of the local breweries i believe the marble palace mm. was was the not the fletcher brewery but uh starts with an f one of the local fleischmann? breweries it yeah it was a I fleischmann it... brewery house like it was mm. i think it was somebody in the families but this is mm. me i think that's what it is well having just watched the segments on prohibition they showed fleischmann something so that's what... yeah it was fleischmann but i'm i can't yeah tell you if that was the mansion was one of theirs that he bought mm -hmm. um and then turned into his but i yeah. suspect there's and, a lot of ghost stories associated with the trauma of all the illegal liquor running and stuff like that yeah i actually have another story in ohio's haunted crime about a haunted bar that had a underground tunnel that was for bootleggers and uh and for a speakeasy so and the the tunnels itself, they have been filled in, but the ghosts still run through the basements where mm -hmm. the tunnels were. Like you can see where the bricked in door was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I witnessed one of those ghosts. And you can read about that in Ohio's Haunted Crimes by Schiffer Publishing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, after watching that segment again, they said that they, and, and this again, talking about all the fancy tunnel systems and stuff, they said that uh, there was a, a farm where they kept a bunch of liquor that he would steal from himself and then sell to people all over the country and they mm -hmm. said it was so well guarded they used to call it uh, death valley or something because yeah the, the route to get it. there yeah, yeah because i so i guess if you did anything like like we're planning on robbing the place or whatever you just would get killed so i wonder if that area is haunted um it's a good that's a good question um i can't yeah. remember exactly where they said it was it's somewhere in the area um, yeah it's i think along the indiana border mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like less than 20 miles from where we're broadcasting from right now yeah so so much interesting history that involved cincinnati and you know is definitely worth following up on there's a couple books that we can list in addition to yeah i know you can see lots of action in the background of my <laughs> there's a haunted man and then a haunted cat <laughs> following him <laughs> this is this is this is our underground tunnel office where i brought this from. So it was just funny with the cat following <laughs> for the food i'm like Yum. yeah they, these cats will shake you down as a matter of fact when we were in eden park we saw these geese getting fed and they reminded mm. me of the cats when they get treats like they're yeah. angling to get in front of each other and stuff oh yeah, yeah so at eden park what did you encounter there well we saw a photo shoot where somebody was wearing this really beautiful like sequined poofy dress um doing a photo shoot and then we also saw like some people sparring and filming that which was kind of neat mm -hmm. they were and, boxing in the yeah. gazebo mm -hmm. and you know oh. you see the thing that's interesting about eden park is you see a slice of everything like the sparring mm -hmm. people doing photo shoots people holding yoga mats people running you know it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of everything teenagers I and mean, people of all ages are hanging around there it's kind of it almost reminds me of uh the tableau in sunday in the park with george you know sort of yeah. thing like everybody's <laughs> out there you know doing their thing of all you know 
walks of life and yeah. it, it was it was really fun to be there um you know it's someplace wasn't it wasn't as crowded as i as i thought it would be well it was freaking think, hot out well there's huh. that and and i think people still are not like congregating in huge yeah, numbers that's true. yet that is true i mean yeah, we're all vaccinated even- but yeah eden park i would almost say is like cincinnati's version of central park um because you get mm-hmm. to see so many of the locals because mm-hmm. cincinnati doesn't have one major large landmark park we have large parks but they're kind of dotted throughout the city mm-hmm. but eden park has been serving cincinnati since 1856 so mm-hmm. it's probably pretty haunted by people besides imogene she has yeah if you really want to see party ghosts- of people I, I would probably suggest Washington Park is probably much more likely to have. Well, given that it used to be a popper uh-huh. cemetery, yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and we did have mm-hmm. lunch by Washington Park afterwards, kind of. We mm-hmm. went to, um, you know, Qu- have. Quan Hapa. Yeah, we went to Quan Hapa <gasps> for lunch. Quan so good. Afterwards. So, so we were kind of, you know, in all the areas with ghosts. Because I think actually a lot of the places on Vine Street are supposed to have you know Mm -hmm. and 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 maybe eventually we can do some on location recording about some of these areas because i I, they all seem like they they're rich with activity we should do the um beer tunnel tour yes that's fun and cold yeah i it's so cool to see um how they i mean because they used to store the beer down there because it was so cold but they used one of them in one of the movies that was filmed here. I can't remember which one. I think it was a Bruce, one of the Bruce Willis movies. But um, I don't know where I was going with that. Those they're it's just a backdrop. Kind of, no, they had a cl- they had a bar in there. Oh um, yeah, and Ghost it was bar? like a, no, it was just like an underground bar. No, go, the, no, there I, was an underground bar called Ghost Bar. Was it? Okay. So, girl, I am so out of touch with drinking and bars and such. Okay. I thought I had read something that there was one there. And mm-hmm. I don't know if it was there before or after the filming of the movie. Or I think they were around something. the same time. Because I think Ghost yeah. Bar is what took over the area, Christina, where Jay's art exhibit was. Oh, uh, yes, yes. That was cool. That was in those mm. old tunnels. Yeah. Yeah. I missed yeah. out on that because I was pregnant at the time and those were kind of dangerous to navigate. But mm-hmm. um, yeah. It was that, a really that's... wonderful exhibit. I enjoyed it yeah. very much. It looked really cool. I've seen, I've seen photos of the exhibit. You mm-hmm. know what? I think that is the same one that was on the tour. Yeah. It, it's yeah. a very easy access one. Yeah. yeah. You just only yeah. go down like one staircase from the street to get to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's a very popular events venue. But definitely so. if you're a listener and you're in Eden Park doing yoga or there for any other purpose and you sketching. happen to see if you're there sketching, we have had sketching there before. I don't know if anyone reported seeing anything there. Mm-hmm. But um, if you do say anything, I have a couple friends that have art studios in Eden Park. You know, if you ever see anything, let us know because we'd like mm-hmm. to know if you see Imogene or perhaps any other sort of uh, uh, sort of haunting around the area. Uh, I was going to say specters in the dark. Yeah, specters in the dark mm-hmm. or light. I suppose. Yeah. I suppose if you just see someone and and you know 20s clothing that comes up and talks to you you know maybe they're not actually there maybe they're yeah you you got a variety you got all the way from early victorian all the way through to present day so Mm -hmm. of of dress so Mm -hmm. i always kind of like um oh what is it oh in boston the square there heart not harvard square what is the boston's boston common yeah boston Mm -hmm. commons has that really cool uh mccloskey uh statue of the well Vikings. what i was gonna say well one boston common has a cemetery in it but two really it is not uncommon yeah it's really um it's at one of the sides and i can't remember which direction it's at i want to say west i'm sure somebody from boston will come and correct me but um anyway um it is not uncommon for people to witness ghosts from early victorian to edwardian era outfits 
prodenading around Boston Common at all times of day. They'll just see these phantoms. And uh, yeah, so that's I, cool. I'm sure, yeah, it's really cool. And I'm sure Eden Park would be very similar. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. on that note, we have a Remus related hometown haunt. So tell us about what about this hotel that uh, uh, the, the Robin was the seal at. Box. I, I can't off the top of my head. I don't remember a whole lot, but I do know it is one of the the Seelbach Hotel is in Louisville and it is notably haunted. Um, I kind of lump it together with the hotels from uh, French Lick, Indiana, the large casino, very prohibition gilded era age hotels in the Midwest of uh, so basically Kentucky and Indiana and they were popular places for mobsters to hang out and I believe it's where F. Scott Fitzgerald met George Remus and (laughs) Remus was one of the inspirations for um, The Great Gatsby so just his larger than life persona was one of the things that created the Gatsby character so with that we have a hometown haunt from robin yeah who knew cincinnati has such interesting ties okay this is from robin uh she says a couple years ago i was in louisville staying at the sealbach hotel for the bourbon classic it's a big bourbon event where lots of different distilleries get together do tastings cocktail competitions etc I had some time to kill early in the afternoon before the big event, so I went down to the Rathskeller room to sketch. There was nobody down there but me, no furniture, just a big empty room. So I sat down on the ground with my back up against one of the, pil- one of the pillars and started sketching. I only got about a half an hour in to my sketch and I started feeling very off. My head started pounding and my chest got really tight to the point of not being able to breathe that well. It honestly felt like somebody was sitting on my chest. So I had to stop sketching and go upstairs because I felt horrible. As soon as I got upstairs, I immediately felt better. My headache was gone and I could breathe again. It was a night and day difference. I went straight to the front desk and asked one of the employees if the Rathskeller room was haunted. He pulled out a packet of specific events that have happened at the Sailbuck Hotel in which rooms are said to be haunted. One of the reasons I was so intrigued by the Rathskeller room was not only because it's full of Rookwood pottery, but apparently there was a specific time that George Remus and F. Scott Fitzgerald were in the Rathskeller room. And F. Scott Fitzgerald overheard Remus telling the bartender about his lavish parties at his home in West Price Hill. And the legend has it that it was where the great Gatsby story was born. There's also a picture floating around the internet somewhere of George Remus, Al Capone and F. Scott Fitzgerald at the Rathskell, well, at the Rathskell room. So personally, I just had this feeling that I was surrounded by some spirits down in the Rathskell room and it could have possibly been Remus. The end. Yeah. That's a great story. That is a great story. I remember her telling me about this. About how she felt and everything when it happened. Oh, man. I can just imagine George Remus's ghost going, Remus likes to haunt ladies. (laughs) He seems like he was probably a perv. I don't know. I'm just guessing. I mean, but but his greatest love seems like it was himself. I mean, if you speak yeah. of yourself in the third person and, you know, the, his whole thing of I could buy anyone off and all that stuff, he seems like he was just, you know, one of those kind of guys that just has, was very is, confident in his abilities. Yes. Well, and if you haven't watched why people didn't like him. <laughs> if you haven't watched Boardwalk Empire do, because I had an affinity for the Remus character only because of the history and you know cincinnati and all that and he the actor that played him was was really good mm-hmm. remus likes drinking whiskey in the rapskeller room <laughs> <laughs> that's almost a tongue twister i know but, isn't uh, it? 
I uh, thank you, Robin, for your hometown haunt. I mean, that was very well written too. I love how yes. you worked in the workwood pottery and all the, yes. all of that stuff. And, and, and I said everything correctly. I think. Yeah, you did. This time. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> one take. And Robin is oh. one of our admins of the Cincinnati Urban Sketchers, but she also started an offshoot group called the Bourbon Sketchers. So if you want to talk bourbon and hang out at some of the uh, places, uh, bars in Cincinnati that have a lot of haunted history. We get together. I think we're going to start meeting monthly again and sketch and test bourbons and beers and stuff. I know we've got some breweries lined up that we're thinking about. So um, you can join our Facebook group to get the events for that and sketch with us and, you know, maybe see if we see any ghosts. I think it will be interesting Ooh. to start voy voyaging. See, I watched it with Star <laughs> Trek. It would be great to start voyaging to bars again. <laughs> we will be voyaging. <laughs> To, we to forgot how realms. to people. <laughs> I, you know, that's an assumption. I knew how to do that in the first place, which I'm not sure about. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think I'll credit COVID with that. <laughs> Rima says, breathe, cat. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> oh, oh, hey. oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us for another wonderful episode of the Cincinnati Cabin of Curiosities Presents Hometown Haunts. I'm your host, Cac Loco, once I've regained my breath, and I'm always joined by Jen and Christina. You can follow us at Sin Cabinet Curio on Twitter, at Cincy Cabinet of Curiosities on Instagram, and if you have your own hometown haunt, you can send that to us at hometownhauntedmail at gmail.com. We love to hear it. So thank you and stay curious, everyone. Stay spooky. Rima oh, says, stay spooky. Yeah, yeah Rima says, I have, stay I have spooky. to say, uh, before we go, that I get a lot of people coming up now talking about personal haunting stories and stuff. Uh, you know, please send those to us because we'll read them on the air. And it's interesting how many people have had experiences. So. Yeah, please yeah, share it's them. more it's really more than you think yeah, yeah. it's a lot of people yeah. they're like this thing happened to me or people are sensitive and and see things all the time it seems mm -hmm. like it's a lot more common than you know it, it is is believed perhaps so. yes mm -hmm. remus says share your ghost stories with us yes exactly i think that he would listen to them <laughs> yes <laughs> all right well thank you everyone have a wonderful evening and Remus says stay spooky. Good night. Good Bye. Night. <laughs>